So this is going to be quite a different talk from one that you, from any that you may have heard before, uh, because it's something of a story of uh, how we have evolved our thinking and our research program at, at Bond University in Australia, and and soon we'll be moving to uh, Griffith University. Uh, but um, it, it, it was a very important story because we were writing papers uh, uh, as long as eight years ago on the possibility of autoimmunity uh, as a uh, associated feature in uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis. And we were uh, delighted to see the publications uh, of our colleagues uh, Oyston Fluger and uh, Olaf Meller uh, with the uh, trials of uh, rituximab. So on the basis of that, uh, we wanted to review the sorts of questions that should be asked in the context of a poss possible autoimmune pathomechanism in this disease. So what I'd like to do today is to go through a number of uh, questions, uh, really, and uh, fortunately we have a superb lineup of speakers later in the program who will then answer them. So I'd like to start by uh, firstly asking the question, is ME-CFS an autoimmune disorder? And when you ask that question, you immediately uh, have to think of what is a putative autoimmune target. In other words, what protein structures or others within the cell may be the focus of uh, an autoimmune pathomechanism. So then we'll talk a little bit more about the, uh, the pathomechanism that may uh, apply in, in this uh, disease. What I'd then like to do is to go through in some detail looking at the signs and symptoms of ME, unfortunately with time and time I won't do that in an exhaustive way, but uh, simply to sketch out for you the way our thinking has evolved and then perhaps we can have discussions uh, later about that. I'll touch very briefly on the blood, brain and spinal barriers uh, in as much as they relate to the sorts of things we'll be talking about. I won't go too much into evidence for uh, treatment, as others will do that much better later in the program, uh, but there will be some opportunities to uh, point out to you where there may be, theoretically at least, opportunities for uh, therapeutic intervention if, if all of this goes, uh, goes well. Uh, could I also say that autoimmunity has not been proven in this disease? And could I also say that the hypotheses I'm going to work through with you this morning also have not been proven? But uh, the uh, basis to the talk that I'm giving uh, is as rigorous as I can make it based on uh, publications and so on, and I'll invite very robust uh, discussion about that later. So first is ME-CFS and autoimmune disorder. Now, when uh, those ideas were formulating, we had uh, discussions with Invest in ME and the Alison Hunter Memorial Foundation and Chris Hunter in particular about would it be a good idea to convene some world experts who uh, knew something about autoimmunity, and to actually set up a meeting which was focused with that aim. So we did that, and the last two days we've in fact uh, had a very interesting and very exciting meeting uh, with a number of uh, key players, and I'd like to particularly acknowledge uh, Dame Bridget Ogilvie, who gave the opening address, and uh, Dr Ian Gibson for their contribution to that meeting. Uh, those are the attendees. I won't go through in detail. I apologise if I've left anyone off uh, the list. And this was the purpose of the Clinical Autoimmune Working Group, to explore potential autoimmune pathomechanisms and putative autoimmune targets, as well as possible animal models, whether they could even exist and, and uh, could be applied, and then to talk through the uh, Norwegian study findings of uh, rituximab. So just very briefly to talk about what is uh, autoimmunity, and, and without going into a very detailed uh, description of this, uh, essentially, the uh, immune system can be described in terms of the innate system and the acquired or adaptive uh, process. And it would be important uh, and probably essential to be able to demonstrate there has been B cell or T cell targeting of a putative autoimmune target before you could get away with the hypothesis that uh, this may well be an autoimmune uh, disease. And uh, just to make the point in the context of the Norwegian study that uh, B cells at certain stages of their life cycle, let's be very clear about this, uh, express CD20. Uh, uh, and that that um, is a suitable marker and target for the uh, anti-CD20 uh, rituximab monoclonal antibody. And, uh, and T cells also have a very complex story with 
uh, major histocompatibility uh, recognition, and, uh, and that would need to be demonstrated as well. So we're setting up a number of very challenging questions about what would comprise autoimmunity. And of course, the innate immune system gets in on the act as well. And we've seen really quite extensive publications in the past regarding natural killer cells. Uh, and there's a whole host of other activities in the context of innate autoimmunity or innate immunity that uh, would also need to be addressed. So this is the $64 million question. What are the putative autoimmune targets? And what I'm going to talk about today um, is, because I come from a public health background, um, I, I want to try the line of thinking with you that uh, it is not unusual to develop some sort of autoimmune uh, response uh, through various infections, exposure to various infections. Whether we go on to de develop autoimmune disease uh, is, is another uh, issue. And we, just very briefly, we know that some infections are associated with certain neurological conditions. For example, Campylobacter uh, is strongly associated with uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, a very disabling and potentially fatal illness. But not only Campylobacter, there are other infections as well. So uh, this is where it gets really tricky, that a number of infections may be associated with one disease, or one infection may be associated with a number of diseases, such as Epstein-Barr virus, its association with multiple sclerosis, and a range of other diseases as well. I won't go into molecular mimicry in, in detail. You've probably heard these uh, sort of stories before, uh, but Bob Fujinami and his colleagues in uh, Salt Lake City pioneered uh, the concept of uh, molecular mimicry some uh, 20 years ago, uh, which, uh, and I'm uh, generalising and summarising uh, ruthlessly here, that suggests that there is an autoimmune response to antigenic structures on these organisms, which are then um, uh, mistaken or that the body's response to those uh, structures uh, then targets endogenous uh, structures, perhaps uh, in the central nervous system and the periphery uh, and so on. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail. You could have a seven-day conference on this and still not cover it all. But where I'm leading to with this is that certain diseases, such as Sjogren's syndrome and myasthenia gravis, are associated with autoimmune or antibody responses to certain uh, receptor structures which are important for signalling within the body. And what I particularly want to draw attention to, well, two things. One is that uh, often these are associated with fatigue and uh, other cognitive um, uh, symptoms in, in their clinical presentation. But I really want to focus on a receptor type called the G-protein couple receptor. Now, if it gets too technical, I'll, I'll just try and, and make this um, as understandable as possible. But the, the issue here is it is not a huge leap of imagination to consider that autoimmunity to G-protein couple receptors might occur. It already does occur in other conditions, for example, Sjogren's. So I'm going to talk a little about a relatively new class uh, or discovered class of peptides called vasoactive neuropeptides. And these are related to the glucagon secretin insulin superfamily. And this is the key point. They are potent activators of adenylate cyclase, also known as adenylyl cyclase. And their key role is to produce cyclic AMP from ATP, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But the two members of class we're going to focus on, and I'll use these abbreviations, vasoactive intestinal peptide, or VIP, and pituitary adenylate cyclase activating peptide, or PACAP. So if you hear me using those terms, that's what it relates to. And because they have very similar functions, uh, albeit in some cases quite different, um, I'm going to use VIP or PAKE up in this uh, talk, otherwise it'll get very uh, complicated. So there's a few th questions I'd like to put to you, and I won't be presenting any data in this talk, but my colleague, Professor Sonia marshall Gradisnik will is going to present some very compelling data uh, from our lab, and these are the questions I would like you to be thinking about when uh, those data are being presented. And uh, there are essentially three receptor types, and I won't go into too much detail about this, but VPAC1, VPAC2, and PAC1 uh, receptors, of which there are probably multiple subtypes uh, because of uh, different uh, molecular uh, structures. And this will be important when we start to talk about the potential uh, range of clinical symptoms that maybe just maybe are presenting in uh, MECFS. So 
All I'm putting to you, or all I'm able to put to you, is what I'd call smoking gun evidence. We were very fortunate to have Professor Noel Rose from um, the WHO Centre for Autoimmune Disease Research at Johns Hopkins University attend our meeting. And uh, he talked about direct evidence, indirect evidence, and circumstantial evidence. So I'm putting all that together and calling it smoking gun evidence, and, and we'll see how we go with that notion. Now, this is a characteristic receptor type. This is a, a PAC1 receptor. And uh, the important uh, features about this, and I'll just draw your attention to the extracellular uh, structure here with the amino end. This is the cell membrane, and this characteristic heptahelical or seven uh, structure of the receptor here and the carboxyl or internal or intracellular um, structure here. But what puts this into what's called a class 2 or family B GPCR is this very long uh, extracellular tail. Uh, now, does that have some role in uh, potential autoimmunity? And this has not been demonstrated yet. So we're, we're on kind of new ground here which, uh, for which we yet do not have uh, the evidence. This is a more cartoon version of what goes on. And I draw your attention to these darkened areas here, which are quite critical for the binding of the neuropeptide, which we'd call the ligand as a generic term. And here's a kind of a binding cleft or a binding groove, and the neuropeptide comes in here. And these structures are apparently quite critical for the correct um, triggering by the neuropeptide of the biochemical processes we'll look at in a moment. Now, it's not as simple as this. Uh, the B family GPCRs, to my knowledge, have not been characterised by X-ray crystallography, uh, although the family I have, Rhodopsin, uh, have because they're a simpler structure. So it's not only the sequence of amino acids, but the conformation and structure and shape of the receptor, which is probably critical for effective transmission of the re required stimulus. And, and my point here is that uh, what would happen if uh, autoimmunity or antibodies were in some way to interfere with this receptor triggering. Uh, now, could that be um, you know, of damaging consequence? And that gets a bit sophisticated, as we'll see shortly. It's getting a little bit more uh, tricky if we imagine this now to be the G-protein coupled receptor. This um, alpha subunit here, this horseshoe-shaped uh, thing, will dissociate and move across to the adenylate cyclase enzyme. Uh, to my knowledge, there's nine or ten in the, of the adenylate cyclases uh, in this family, and it triggers this uh, conversion of ATP, we'll look at that in a minute, uh, to cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP, as you're probably aware, is one of the most important intracellular transmitters, along with many others, of course, but this is a very uh, common and important uh, signalling transmission system. So how would this work as a proposed pathomechanism? So a little bit of Biochem 101, and we'll spend a moment or two looking at this in detail because it is important, not only in terms of the potential pathomechanism we're looking at, but in the possibility of drug treatment or other therapeutic interventions. Now, this is ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and these are the three phosphate molecules here, generally regarded as high energy, and very important in terms of uh, energy um, processes within in the cell. And here we have adenylate, adenylate or adenylyl cyclase, which then rips off a couple of phosphate molecules, and you're left with this cyclic structure of one phosphate molecule, and hence the name cyclic AMP. Now, it's important not to confuse this with AMP, because cyclic AMP, to my knowledge, it, there is no redundant pathway. This is a single and highly dependent and highly critical pathway uh, within the cell, and what happens in terms of regulation, two things here which I want you to focus on is how important these adenylate cyclase enzymes are in converting ATP to cyclic AMP. The second is the role of the cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase enzymes, and we'll call those PDEIs for shorthand, uh, will um, basically convert the cyclic AMP uh, to, to AMP. And then that cuts off the signalling mechanism of this very, very important molecule here, cyclic AMP. Now, just to give you an idea how this might work, this is a very, uh, very busy sort of diagram, but we're just going to focus on this particular one here. See the neurotransmitter? Now, these neuropeptides um, have what we, we call pleiotropic effects. They have an enormous range of very, very important functions within the cell. 
So not, our, uh, are they, not only are they neurotransmitters, uh, but they have a range of uh, immune modulation functions and so on. And this is what we're going to drill down to uh, a little while uh, later in, in this talk. So here we have adenylate cyclase converting ATP to cyclic AMP, which triggers uh, protein kinase, kinase A, uh, or through that mechanism, uh, results on, on gene transcription within the cell. And there's two very important uh, protein modulators of this role that we'll uh, talk about in a moment, uh, CREB and ISA. Uh, but basically that has a very strong and powerful role of a whole range of gene transcriptions within the cell. And uh, so a little bit about cyclic AMP. It's referred to as a secondary messenger because it operates within the cell. All the other uh, neuropeptides and all the other things we saw in that uh, other slide uh, impacting on the surface of, of the cell are regarded as primary neurotransmitters. And the other thing to remember is that, they, that cyclic AMP is not uh, homogeneously um, distributed through, uh, through the cell. They operate in, si in micro domains as a result of the different distribution of these adenylate cyclases uh, through, through the cell and what a key role they have in cellular uh, metabolism. And these are modulated through Krebs and Isa and I won't go into too much detail here, but uh, the first is the cyclic nucleotide response element binding protein, and the other is the inducible uh, cyclic nucleotide early response uh, protein. Now, why this is important is that they have an incredibly vital role in CNS neuroplasticity, cognition, memory, and a whole range of central nervous system functions. So what I'm trying to draw here is a theoretical argument of what would happen if things went wrong in this uh, neurotransmitter system. We'll talk about the blood-brain barrier a little bit later in the talk, uh, but just to make the point here, how critically dependent the BBB and blood spinal barriers and probably other barriers as well are on um, the role of cyclic AMP. And we'll talk a bit about some of the cells that make up the blood-brain barrier and, um, and just a little bit. It, it's impossible to cover all this in, in one very brief talk as you could have a seven-day conference on that and still not uh, cover it all. But just to make this point that uh, certain cytokines such as IL-1, beta and TNF-alpha are very toxic to the blood-brain barrier and um, these, these pathways are basically controlled or, or mitigated by cyclic AMP. So it, it's begging the question here of is there some uh, process that's happening at the blood-brain barrier or blood-spinal barrier that we're yet to work out? And I just want to make the point that we have no uh, histopathology proof of this yet, so this is yet another piece of speculation. Um, I won't go into too much detail about this, but those G proteins that we talked about before can be stimulatory or inhibitory. So as well as stimulating the development of cyclic AMP, there are others in that subfamily which are inhibitory and, and work against that. Uh, so we also know that in autoimmunity we have what's called gain of function and loss of function. So you can have a very complex array of outcomes where you may have gain or loss of function of a stimulatory G protein or gain or loss of function of an inhibitory protein. So if you work out the mathematics of that, you can see that we are in a very complex environment of trying to work out what is going on. Now, adenylate, just to recap on what we said, adenylate cyclase is the only pathway we know of to drive cyclic AMP from ATP. But adenylate cyclase, and this is important, acts as a coincidence uh, detector. It's like an amplifier in, in your stereo system. That if there is some mechanism uh, underway, either physiological or pathological, then adenylate cyclases act to amplify that within, uh, within the cell. And as I mentioned before, uh, the three receptors that we are talking about with um, uh, these vasoactive neuropeptides are PAC1, VPAC, uh, v PAC1, VPAC1 and VPAC2. Now, there are quite a number of other vasoactive neuropeptides, so don't go away with the impression that this is the be-all and end-all. There are uh, probably another, uh, a number of other uh, neuropeptides that also function as hormones, uh, which may be equally potent. But the reason I've uh, selected these two is they are enormously potent as adenylate cyclase uh, activators, maybe up to 100 times or more uh, in terms of their potency compared to others. And this is a, a theoretical point, but PACAP, the unique receptor for PACAP um, is, um, is PAC1 here, and VIP does not appear to trigger PAC1 
um, anywhere near that same level. It might be 100 times less. It still does, but not very effectively at all. Whereas VIP normally would activate VPAC1 and VPAC2, uh, but PACAP is kind of a master modulator because it can also act on VPAC1 and VPAC2 as well as its cognate receptor PAC1. Uh, PAC and there are other consequences of this activity of cyclic AMP metabolism expressed through microRNA activity that uh, Sonia will talk about uh, in a little while. Now, this is something I really want you to focus on, that these are regulatory co-transmitters for two of the most important uh, neurotransmitter synthesising systems within the body. Uh, the two we're going to talk about are the catecholamine uh, group, um, adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, for example, and this enzyme here, tyrosine hydroxylase, is a rate-limiting and important and vital step in the uh, production of adrenaline, noradrenaline and dopamine. And these neuropeptides, uh, VIP and PACAP, act um, uh, on the synthesis of um, those catecholamines through tyrosine hydroxylase. But the other important thing is that they also uh, act on the acetylcholine system, which is a very important system, not only in terms of skeletal muscle neurotransmission, but also in uh, the autonomic nervous system, preganglionic activity and so on, through this enzyme here called choline acetyltransferase. So if you really wanted to do some serious damage to neurological functioning and a whole bunch of other activities uh, within the body, you would compromise uh, the function of adenylate cyclase and vasoactive neuropeptides. And the, the downstream effect of that is that you'd, you'd expect skeletomuscular uh, impairment in functioning and autonomic uh, transmission as well. And um, I mentioned before about uh, the role of these, uh, of the cyclic AMP signaling system within uh, plasticity and so on within the cell. Uh, and there are numerous examples we'll, we'll touch on in a little while, but uh, they are very important for what's called long term potentiation and enhancing maintenance of neural activity. And to make the point also that these are what are known as stress uh, modulators. You, your uh, synthesis of, of these um, uh, structures here, the, these uh, biochemical molecules here, uh, can more or less tick along, but when the body is subject to stress, whether it's injury, infection, uh, whatever, uh, then these vasoactive neuropeptides kick in because of their incredibly powerful impact on modulating these neurotransmitters here. Um, they also have so many functions, I can't possibly go through them all in this meeting, but, uh, but a couple of important ones will come up when we uh, check the symptom presentation against how these um, neuropeptides function. But there are a couple of important ones here that I think you do need to know about up front. Uh, is one is that they regulate cardiac firing. They have what's called endotropic and chronotropic functions. So they are very important in potentiating the, the strength and rate of cardiac contractions. Now, interestingly, in MECFS, there's been considerable discussion about is there hypovolemia, hypovolemia, that is a reduced blood volume, in patients with MECFS. And it, it probably is. And it was, always, it was suggested that cardiac uh, dysfunction in, in these patients uh, has been brought about by this hypovolemia. Now, I'm, I'm putting to you the, the case that perhaps there are two things going on. One is there is compromise of these inotropic and chronotropic functions, but also PACAP in particular has a very important role in renin uh, modulation within the kidney, which is all about fluid resorption uh, and maintenance of blood volume. Uh, if, if any of this, if you're concerned that you're, you're maybe not, not following the, the logic, please go to PubMed and maybe put in a few key words and the literature will come up and many of those articles are free articles. You can download them and, and read them uh, and get greater depth than what I'm able to talk about here. Another very important function of these neuropeptides is their anti-apoptotic role. Now, there's a couple of key events, which I won't go into detail, but uh, um, different uh, molecules such as ceramide, uh, ceramides and caspases and cytochrome C are very important triggers uh, for cell apoptosis. And in other words, once, once these start being uh, wound up or excreted from the cell, often that means that there has been a commitment for cell death, for apoptotic cell death, uh, which would normally be countered by these vasoactive neuropeptides. So, uh, possibly... If these uh, functions are in some way compromised, we may see an upregulation of caspase, cytokine C and so on, and increased apoptosis, which would be very, very negative for uh, survival and uh, homeostasis. 
Also, people with ME-CFS describe a crash of, um, or a hypoglycemia, which is not necessarily followed in terms of serum glucose levels. But at the intracellular level, uh, CMP is very, is very important for what's called pulsatile insulin control. In other words, it modulates with great sensitivity the role of insulin in, in modulating the um, uh, glucose and, and glucon, uh, glucagon um, uh, control. This is also very interesting, that uh, a group from uh, Hungary, I think it is, uh, Reglodi and others, uh, found that in turtles who are very experienced at diving to some depth and going without oxygen for a long period of time, have something like a thousand times the concentration of these neuropeptides, particularly PACA. So what that means is, and we can draw perhaps not so long a bow, that uh, hypoxia regulation is very important, uh, not only for turtles, but for us as well. And that if we were to have some compromise of this vasoactive neuropeptide function, we are getting potentially a virtual hypoxia, which uh, may explain uh, many of the symptoms that people with MECFS get. There are numerous biochemical pathways that I don't have time to go through, so I'm sorry if I'm rushing a little bit, but uh, I just need to get through it as best I can, that um, glutamate metabolism is very important, and you've probably, probably been following this to some extent, that glutamate metabolism is very important within the brain as a neurotransmitter. It's probably the most important excitatory, um, excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, but it also becomes very toxic in excess or uncontrolled or dysregulation of, of glutamate. And glutamate requires glutamine synthetase, which probably operates within the astrocytes to convert um, to glutamine um, uh, after uh, cellular absorption, and then glutamine is channeled back through to the neurons where um, they do what they're supposed to do. Now, a couple of things here. One is that, to my knowledge, this is the only CNS mechanism for ammonia detoxification, and it's through this pathway here. So glutamate, actually, it's kind of a, a, a double benefit, as well as uh, glutamate doing its role as, an, as a uh, transmitter. It will become toxic if it's um, allowed to continue in excess levels. So it actually combines with ammonia, which is also a very toxic uh, molecule, and uh, I won't go into sort of ammonia metabolism in any detail, but this is how you form glutamine, which then is important for neuronal function. And this process here is under vasoactive neuropeptide control. So one could then also draw an argument that if there was some uh, impairment of vasoactive neuropeptide function, then this very important biochemical pathway here could be compromised with potential toxicity to the brain through glutamate and ammonia. Uh, this gets very complex, but it's probable that it's through these glutamate transporters uh, that this effect is uh, mediated, and there are a number of drugs that are being uh, trialled that act on these um, uh, transport, glutamate transporters, uh, but these are very important in the, in the production of neuropathic pain, which I'll talk about in a second. You may recall, if you were here last year, Professor Jeff Bernstock talked about purinergic signalling. And we're only beginning to unravel a lot of this, but the ATP that we talked about earlier, uh, the hypothetical question is that if the adenylate cyclase are not working to the extent they should, producing the cyclic AMP that they should, then arguably there is less at eight, there's more ATP uh, potentially in, in the system. Now, in the early days, it was thought that ATP was far too important a molecule to get outside the cell. And uh, the um, theoreticians of the day said that ATP could only operate within the cell because of its important role in cellular metabolism. We now know that ATP outside the cell is a very important neurotransmitter. But in particular, it's a very important indicator of toxic activity. So again, any sort of stress such as infection, injury, uh, whatever, uh, ATP signalling, which is really the benchmark of purinergic signalling, uh, is very important indeed. And that it has roles on the Tregs, uh, which we'll talk about more later. Sonia will go into that in some detail and how ATP negatively regulates uh, adenylate cyclase to make matters even worse. So if there is compromise of adenylate cyclase through some mechanism, then it is likely to involve ATP. Now, you could say, well, that's just wild speculation. But in fact, a group in Salt Lake City, I think it was Alan Light et al, have published this, uh, showing that uh, the purinergic recept receptors 
P2X45 have been upregulated up in ME post exercise compared to controls, uh, where this did not happen. And just a brief summary here P for pure energic, uh, 2 meaning it's of the ATP type. X meaning it's ionotropic, and that's just members of the family, which are about seven or eight. So that all together, if you look at that, I think that this may have a significant bearing on the pathophysiology of ME. And these are the other effects of ATP as well when it works in the extracellular uh, compartment. So what have we got? The likelihood that they activate microglia, which of itself is not necessarily pathological. In a physiological sense, we're activating and deactivating our microglia day in and day out, uh, exposed to toxins in the environment, exposed to the odd cold or flu, uh, so what, who would care? But if it proceeds on to establish gliosis, it's a very, very difficult mechanism to switch off, which may, maybe, just maybe explains the prolonged recovery required for people with MECFS after exposure to some sort of toxic stimulus. And uh, we've mentioned glutamate metabolism, but this is very important because it, um, it's pure energic signalling uh, modulates a whole bunch of very uh, pathogenic type of activities such as uh, pain recognition, uh, mechanosensitivity, thermal sensitivity and oxygen uh, CO2 and um, I won't go into too much about carbon monoxide and oxides of nitrogen but they are generally also very uh, toxic molecules that may well be regulated within the system and that this is exacerbated by this ischemic um, uh, oxygen glucose deprivation or OGD. So I would recommend if you want to know more about this, just look up uh, OGD and uh, ischemia and um, purinergic signalling and vasoactive neuropeptides to get uh, more knowledge about that. So does the story stop there or how does this relate back to the immune cells we mentioned right at the beginning of the acquired and innate immune system? Now, these regulatory T cells, and the, the, there's still a lot of fairly warm debate about this in the international community, so uh, clearly I'm paraphrasing this uh, dreadfully, but the regulatory T cells are of the CD4 uh, positive subset, CD25 positive uh, FOXP3. There are other markers, and yes, FOXP3 lives in other compartments as well, but I'm uh, being very clumsy in saying that T regs are, are largely typified by this structure. And they also carry, uh, a, in, um, in probably the majority of cases, a, um, a new, um, ectonucleotidase called uh, CD39, which is very important for uh, um, metabolising ATP. So these regulatory T cells have a very important role in combating the toxicity that we saw developing before with ATP, should that happen. And it's through this factor here, which is very closely aligned with cyclic AMP metabolism. Indeed, there is some evidence that T regs act in a very physical way by finding contact with their target cell and having direct transfer of cyclic AMP to the target cell. And, and that's this very complex interaction here. And, we're, and uh, the, the scientists are only beginning to unravel uh, this very, very complex story. And, and could this interact on, on the, innate immune, uh, the innate immune system as well, uh, such as natural killer cells? So what we're going to be looking for are some very, very uh, important indicators or markers or biomarkers of what's happening with FOXP3, what's happening uh, with uh, natural killer cells, and, um, and that's going to be critically important. So if we are going to take this hypothesis forward, we need very important data that will tell us what is going on in, in this system. Um, so we've got the innate immune system with all of these different cells, natural killer cells, macrophages and microglia. And the microglia are the, what we'd call the resident macrophage cells within the CNS. So they're very, very linked in terms of their purpose and function and, and so on. Uh, and we've touched on that, but just to make the point here that uh, there is a very important uh, link with microRNA, uh, which Sonia will talk about in more detail. So the question we would want to ask is, are there any abnormalities in the microRNA um, uh, system and in messenger RNA and protein expression? And uh, so I'm sure you will be watching for that uh, data uh, when Sonia presents it. OK, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a... a, a, a Five minutes. OK, well, look, I'm going to have to rush through this, uh, and I do apologise, but I just want to say that what I find disappointing in all the debates so far about the etiology of MECFS is um, this concept that we've discovered a virus, 
whoopee, that's the end of the story. That causes MECFS. And I don't think that's acceptable. I think we need to go through and drill down symptom by symptom, sign by sign, and say, well, OK, how is this actually happening? So on the left here, and I've just got a few slides to talk about this. I won't be able to go through the whole body physiology, but ME symptoms, and I'm going to race through these. Skeletal muscle weakness, fatigability, autonomic symptoms such as sweating, night sweating, and blunting of the cardiovascular system. Emotional lability, people laugh when they should cry, they cry when they should laugh. Memory impairment, concentration impairment, coordination difficulties, and executive functions which are about making the right decisions for the right reasons. And if we look down the list of vasoactive neuropeptide neurotransmitter functions, there's, a, I think, a very good goodness of fit between what these uh, functions are and if they were deranged, could it lead into these uh, symptom uh, presentations. Neuropathic pain is another one that's very poorly understood, uh, but it's likely to be a centrally mediated, mediated phenomenon. Uh, and it goes on about persisting after the initial stimulus. It involves much of the central nervous system, probably involves microglial activation, and uh, certain cytokines will um, uh, possibly be involved in neuropathic pain. Again, matching side by side, ME symptoms, poor sleep-wake cycle control, neuropathic pain, urinary volume and voiding regulation. We mentioned uh, renin control by PACAP before. Uh, skin pallor, this is a these are vasoactive substances. They dilate. So they enhance skin colour, allow blood flow through uh, tissues. Uh, they make sure you've got good thermal regulation and ME. People there may often have cold extremities, uh, have skin pallor, uh, and that may well be related. And also the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis function. And if we look at these vasoactive neuropeptide functions, uh, that's, those are very much the areas that they control. Immunoregulation. We know that... Uh, in ME there is, and I'm not uh, suggesting there is a shift from one to the other, I'm simply saying that in what we broadly call, and I'm using a shorthand here, of the TH1 or uh, generally pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines and TH2 are generally anti-inflammatory and there are significant differences between animal, animal um, models and humans, so you've got to be careful about how you interpret this. Uh, but we know that uh, there's natural killer cell impairment. And we know, well, and perhaps um, Sonia will tell us more about what actually happens here and microRNA, what happens there, and uh, exquisitely uh, tender, painful skin sites. And these are all areas controlled by vasoactive neuropeptide function. I mentioned before um, the uh, p potential action on the heart. Uh, including, um, uh, metabol uh, including the uh, rate and timing and strength of cardiac contraction, resulting in um, impaired atrioventricular filling and impaired stroke volume, uh, which are all uh, controlled by this vasoactive neuropeptide system. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to raise a bit here. So if we were to put together a potpourri of all the possible pathomechanisms that may come, may come through a derangement of the vasoactive neuropeptide system, we would see immune derangement, we would see oxides of nitrogen and peroxynitrite and even carbon monoxide metabolism derangement, ammonia and glutamate derangement, uh, perhaps compromise the blood-brain barrier, cardiovascular issues, cerebral hypoperfusion, hypoxia, cold extremities, immune function and purinergic signalling perturbations which have already been demonstrated by Light et al. I'm getting near the end. Um, the blood-brain barrier, a very important mechanism to keep unwanted uh, molecular uh, substances out of the central nervous system and uh, fairly similar in the spinal cord as well. These endothelial cells here, the pink, are very important as being the, uh, basically the control vasculature in this. Uh, and these are the very, very smallest part of the cerebral vasculature. So we're talking you know, beyond the arteriole into the capillaries before it becomes the venules, the veins, and then returns uh, uh, away from the brain. And a very important cell here is the pericyte uh, because of its regulatory functions, particularly in cyclic AMP. And here we have the astrocyte, the astrocyte end feet, very important in terms of regulatory function, uh, the neuron and the microglia, which are like the uh, Praetorian guard, if you like, of the CNS. Uh, very good when they're on your side, not so good when they're not. And if we were to see some derangement at that level of the microvasculature, would this show up on uh, MRI, MRI? And the answer is yes, it does. Uh, however, I'm, I'm very careful in not necessarily drawing a link to what I've just said, but to make the association. And this paper here, I don't have time to go into it, but I'd recommend you uh, go to Barnden and Quartet et al. 
and MR Biomed, uh, December 2011, where they have found that in uh, the study of these patients here, disordered microcirculation uh, in CFS patients, uh, and these are uh, related in a reasonably direct way with clinical severity. Uh, the findings are associated with the onset of illness, that these findings can, through their uh, mathematical gymnastics, be uh, assigned to the point of onset of the illness, and that it is associated with loss of central nervous system structure and function. These are all the functions of the parasites. Clearly, I don't have time, as I've run out of time, uh, to go under this in, uh, through this in detail, but the pericytes are incredibly important for control of the blood-brain barrier, and those are all the reasons why. Uh, and I'm sorry I don't have time to go into that in more detail. And this is what it looks like in the cartoon format. Uh, the green is the pericyte. These are all the functions, the maintenance of tight junctions, which are responsible for the blood-brain barrier, regulation of the vascular stability uh, and architecture, uh, regulation of the extracellular matrix, um, and uh, regulation of capillary diameter and blood flow. Right? Remember, the default is vasoconstriction, which will result in ischemia and hypoxia. So you need these neuropeptides to dilate these vessels at, at this level here. And, of course, they also have a phagocytic uh, function in terms of uh, clearing away unwanted debris. So, uh, and I don't have time to talk about potential treatments now, but uh, in summary, let me say that novel autoimmune pathomechanisms may be implicated in post uh, and possibly other origin fatigue-related conditions. These vasoactive neuropeptides may impl be implicated in MECFS, and that novel and existing treatments may be indicated. I'd better wrap up, and thank you very much for your attention, and I'll simply acknowledge at the end the uh, excellent contribution of the Clinical Autoimmune uh, Working Group, uh, and Tom Wildman, Ian Gibson, and Dame Bridget for their role in that. Uh, signing my colleague, Dr Eckhoff Brenou, uh, who's done a, a more than the lion's share of uh, research in our lab, and uh, the conveners invested in ME and the Alison Hunter Memorial Foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much.